I'm Frank Romano. I'm president of the Museum of Printing. I'm only president because I missed a board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here because a project was started last year uh, called Shift Happens. Marcin, please tell us why you started that project. Yeah. Um, so, oh my God, it's multiple stories coming together. There's no like clear origin story, but basically I'm, I'm a designer in real life and I've always been like interested in computers, honestly, and input output because that's what the user interface design is. And um, the I happen to work at Medium, which is the, Jeff would know how to describe it better than I do. It's a blog publishing platform thingy. And with the best typography on the internet. And it had uh, typewriters in different rooms. It had new rooms named after typewriters. And I knew obviously typewriters and all of that, but I started looking at them. And then this is uh, 2015 or 2016. I started looking at them and, and I just kind of like when you look at all of the keyboards here, each one is slightly different. Each one has like, a, oh, there's a key that says something new, or maybe the letter is juxtaposed. And I started wondering about that. I was like, why is this backspace called backspacer and it's on the left and all of this stuff. And I started reading about it and I started writing about it. And then it turned out people like reading about this, which actually <laughs> surprised me. I wrote this article about a Turkish typewriter with this unique layout. And people from Turkey were like, oh my God, somebody, you know, I, I'm from Poland, so I sort of recognize like when somebody from America cares. Uh, and, and, and they got like really excited about it. And, and, and so uh, eventually uh, I wrote a, a few pieces online and I thought I'm going to write more. And then the last piece of a puzzle for me, I arrived at mat mathematically thinking, oh, if I can write like 10 pieces, that's like a book length. And... That's sort of like maybe the origin story was that I realized like I have a book's worth of material, which is hilarious in hindsight because I have five books worth of material in the end. <laughs> There's two volumes and right. we had to, Glenn was cutting like, get rid of this chapter, get rid of this chapter. So, so, so the jokes on me, uh, keyboards ended up being this sort of endless journey. And I, I literally learned new things even just now from looking at fragged keyboards. So, the journey continues, but that's sort of the origin story. Okay, so then you brought Glenn into the pro pro project? Well, Glenn brought Glenn into the project. <laughs> <laughs> so Glenn, explain your, your process. Well, oh, you know, I've been following this guy. I heard about uh, Marcin, you know, in, oh, because I had some connections with Medium. I did a little work with them, and I'd read his essays, and I love the typography on Medium. And I think, did you write the piece about the underline, how you got CSS to do underlines? And I was like, here's somebody who really cares about what this looks like. This isn't a, a, a medium that should look ugly. It's very important. And um, uh, at some point, Marcin actually, I'm telling his story, but he wanders into a museum in Spain uh, that has one of the greatest type of, or typewriter collections in the world and posts this mega thread that goes viral and people write about it around the world. And I spot this and I'm like, I need to know this guy better because his interests and mine parallel. And so I found the email at some point after I interviewed for an article I was doing for The Atlantic about whether typographer or curly quotes were dying out on the web. And the answer was sort of, and the answer is still sort of. And I interviewed Marcin because yeah. he had been writing about the, you know, working at Medium and whatever. And so at some point, I found this email recently, I think seven years ago. I wrote him and said, this is an odd question, but are you looking for an editor? And maybe, you know, something, <laughs> maybe you should hire me to be your editor. And it just spiraled out of control into what we've been doing. I think I'm approaching... 400 hours of work on the project, and you've probably put in 8,000, or I don't know, you don't even want to know. Um, but that's how that's I got so involved. Annoying. I just thought Martina is a good storyteller, had good stories to tell, and you know, could I help facilitate this? And so far, yes, we'll see. We're going on press next week on Monday up in Maine, and we'll that's see how exciting. It all, it'll, exciting. it'll all be great. I should see how it works out, but that's kind of the culmination of like five years working with you on that. Wow. So the next step was Jeff came into the project. Jeff, what did you do? This project? Uh, nothing but be a fan. Um, uh, I, I just um, um, made sure that we had Glenn and, and Marcin on, on the podcast this week in Google and, uh, and loved it dearly. While I have the floor, I just want to say, Frank, thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for everything you do for, for this. Um, this place is, is, 
is a dream. Your knowledge is phenomenal. You're so generous with it, and it's, it's and, our gang of volunteers. And you, well, you're and you're you're humble too. Uh, yeah. But thank you. This is just a great, great place. And then, lastly, Doug, you came into the project. Now, Doug is famous for having done Linotype the movie. Uh, I would put air quotes around famous, but yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I made Lana type the film. Um, also, just like Jeff, I am just a fan of Martian. Martian, I remember his your Twitter thread when you went to that Spanish typewriter museum, and I just was like, oh, this guy got so excited about typewriters, and like, it, I just remember that thread just being a great story. And I think you're a really good writer. And so, yeah, I also was just kind of a fan of it. Um, I had known about Glenn, but through this process, uh, kind of connected personally with Glenn because he was the editor. Um, and for me, I'm just thrilled that I don't have to research the story of the typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> like my goal now is just have other people like, nerd out about stuff and then I can just like ask you if I have a question about like a, a QWERTY keyboard I just get to ask you now like yeah there is a there is a sort of like inverse story that, that you might not know so when was the premiere of your movie uh 2012 in so, New York so uh there was probably a showing in San Francisco somewhere. yeah at the type kit um yeah oh, oh, so yeah. Uh, Doug doesn't know this yet, but I went to this uh, showing of the movie. Oh, cool. And then I met another person who happened to work at Medium, and that's how I got the job at Medium. Are you oh. serious? I so didn't know that. Was, oh, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> Actually, that's, I think I have a story too. Now that you mention that, I went to the premiere <laughs> in Seattle. In, in Seattle in yeah. 2012. And I think that's what got me on the track to do an artist in residency five years ago, which is why I'm here. So there's the there's the there I'm I'm wow. I reconnected with people there, and those that's, that's great. We uh, found a great connection. Well, here's the thing, right? Like, how many people in the world actually care deeply about this stuff? <laughs> we all kind of, there's one degree there's one degree of separation, the, right? The nerds. Yeah. Frank, yeah, Frank, I'll say I try to. I, I'm not as good as I uh, was. At Ruth in. Uh, Chicago, the famous Malcolm Gladwell connector. But I'm always like, at one point I'm talking to Doug, and he's like, I'm thinking about doing a book at Linotype. And then I'm on a podcast with Jeff, and Jeff says, I'm writing a book about the Linotype. I'm like, maybe those yeah, guys should That's talk. right, yeah. Maybe I can introduce them <laughs> yeah, gently to, to see Jeff where I'm yeah. writing two different books about the Linotype. But it's, we just have this, um, we have this, I think, shared love of what, um, how certain kinds of technology have contributed or detracted from communication. Mm -hmm. And so through all of our different work, we're all kind of in that same boat. And I think each of us at different times, we all been on all, uh, Marching's like, uh, um, with Emporada de Spigaros, I can't remember pronounce it, the, uh, the museo in, um, in Spain. We haven't had the uh, open up the door and you're in the museum of printing and oh my God, what is here? Holy cow. Haven't had exactly that discovery moment, but I've had moments like that where you're suddenly, oh, someone says, oh, well, look in this back room. Like, Holy cow, this has changed my understanding of this aspect of history or, or what it means. Um, part, of, part of what, yeah, I was talking to Frank earlier. I, I'm not as old as Frank, but I'm getting there. No one's as old as me. Um, uh, so Frank especially, but also even me, got to live on this watershed moment from Gutenberg and hot type. And then the moment when hot lead went away, photo composition and then, and then uh, postscript and such. But the change in society around that, it was, it was phenomenal. And we're so lucky to have been alive and, and working with. And we're trying to record it all right now on all those changes that exactly. they were seismic. Well, let's get back to what your project is all about. So, Marcin, who invented the keyboard? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, so, the answer is nobody knows, probably. Um, the, what I found in my research, and there's, there's a bunch of foundational questions, right? It's like, is QWERTY bad or, or great? <laughs> or is Dvorak better? And what is the, there's a few other ones that people just like want to know the answers. And unfortunately, I think we might never know the answers. What I, what I find fascinating is the whole, even the word keyboard was, is a misnomer in a way because it comes from music because early typewriters used musical keyboards. That's correct. And the key is the key of the music. And it should be called a button board if you think about it for two <laughs> and a half seconds, but it's not. So yeah. I don't have a good answer for that. But of course, uh, as you can see here, there's sort of like the, the first QWERTY keyboard 
almost exactly 150 years ago, happened to be the one that conquered it all, right? Like even a lot of the typesetting. So keyboards, we're talking about the Scholes keyboard. The Scholes and Didon keyboard, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and there were really interesting layouts afterwards, and there were really interesting mm -hmm. typewriters and layouts even centuries before. Uh, which is why everybody still argues what is the first keyboard, what is the first typewriter, because like with everything, if you start putting like modifiers, right, like the first commercial or the first successful. Well, let me let me bring it down. Was the Scholes QWERTY keyboard the first major alphabetic keyboard that succeeded? I mean, was the Kugels, yeah. was it the, uh, the uh, Danish one that was... That was pretty production, didn't Nietzsche use Yeah, that that's the thing. I think By the yes. way, got the yes. idea from an article he read, The Scientific American. Yeah, so this was already like built on, on inspiration from another typewriter, but I think yes, I think the answer would be yes. So he lays out the keys now. Yeah. Now, we all know that Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P, that that <laughs> line contains all the letters for the word typewriter. There's gonna be a fight, watch out folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on. What is your opinion as to what that all means? <laughs> Um, Did he do that purposely to be able to find the letters for the word typewriter? The evidence points to yes. Okay. Oh, Actually, somebody, uh, 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 Professor Alan Kay, not Alan Kay, Alan Kay is a different, Neil Kay, a professor in the UK, analyzed this about 10 years ago mathematically, um, uh, as well as other aspects of the QWERTY keyboard. And he basically said, it would be an incredible coincidence mm. for the word typewriter to just arrive in a row of a keyboard on its own, which he claims to mean this wasn't an accident. They did it on purpose just maybe so it's easier to demo. Or when, it, when they sold the rights to the Remington Arms Company, Remington took, took one letter and switched it from that row, but did not affect the typewriter. Mm. This is something I'd say about about like the first keyboard is interesting. Quite like the commercialization of things, keyboards and other products. But like there were definitely things put into production before the Remington version. Um, but they weren't like you know if you sell twenty of something is that, it's not a commercial success. But what the Nietzsche Nietzsche used uh, Friedrich Nietzsche used the the Danish the, 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 the writing the, ball the writing yeah, ball right writing you know ball. and you can find the writing ball they have one I was at the German Technology Museum and they had one there just like oh yeah this is you know the and they'll call it the first one of the first successful typewriters but really I mean how many do you sell dozens yeah. right not hundreds there, or thousands there is a stenotyping keyboard that's still used in Italy that is older than the QWERTY keyboard it's called Michela I think or something like this but is that enough of a success right. uh, just the courts of Italy using it, you know, I don't know. What sold a thousand units? And that's yeah. easy if you do that. Mm -hmm. By the way, one of the Bibles we have in the Bible room is completely in shorthand. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. <laughs> Which is interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it's Pittman or Gray, but I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, key, and the keyboard becomes a revolutionary device because it now becomes the, the basic unit of every form of communication that we're going to use until the telephone comes along. <laughs> So you've tracked in your epic book, uh, or books, I guess it is now, um, <laughs> the history of the keyboard. What was the next major change after Scholl's QWERTY keyboard? So I, in my book, and again, everybody will have probably their own lens, I kind of have, I, I posit that there are like five important keyboards in a history. And it's just like my, my thing. Uh, the first one is Scholl's and Gliden. Uh, the second one is Underwood number five, which is the like the first typewriter hit, you know, sell, sells millions of copies. Uh, the third one is the Selectric, which uh, many of you maybe maybe re recognize. Uh, the fourth one is the Model M, which was like the very important computer keyboard. And the last one, anybody wants to guess? Not something you think of the iPhone. Yeah, the iPhone. Yeah. Right? Like maybe we don't love it, but it's important. And I threw in the sixth one, which is correcting Selectric number two, which is just like my personal favorite. <laughs> so, uh, so from that, I think probably like you know the Underwood number five arriving in 1901, and just basically solidifying not just the QWERTY, but you know two shifts on both sides, so the basic tenets of like the the keyboard that we still as we use today. And uh, at this moment, I think the typewriter is just functional right it just works like we don't have to worry about did, did i choose the wrong, wrong layout or a wrong thing 
this is gonna break under me. Is it gonna hurt me if I use it? No, it's reliable. Uh, oh. So we, we we sort of start seeing just typewriter just kind of coming into general use in offices and everywhere. The, okay. the, let's stay historically where we are now, because now uh, we find this man, James Ogilvy Clefe in Yay. Washington, D.C., who is one of the testers of the typewriter for Scholes. And he is also the first person to start investing in and creating the syndicate to support the linotype machine. And he tells Atmar Mergenthaler that there should be a keyboard on the linotype. Now, this is where you come in, Doug. Mm -hmm. What happens next? My understanding is that Mergenthaler either does his own research or finds um, some research about letter frequency in the English language. And I don't know, and I don't know if you've learned anything. I don't know why he lays it out the way that he lays it out. And by the way, here's the layout. It's right. So it's, on my shirt. So <laughs> it goes down E T A O I N S H R D L U C M P V W K V no V V G K Q J X Z. Right on. Uh, hey. um, I only remember that because someone else remembered that, uh, and and I just had to edit that's, that. That's a parlor trick that that's only works at so many parties. One person, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. So what it is is the Linotype keyboard has lowercase on the left side, um, figures and punctuation in the middle, and then uppercase on the right. So this is an interesting thing because I know some keyboards at some point had uppercase and lowercase separate. Just one right there. Yeah. Um, and so that's very interesting to me. So I don't know exactly, honestly, why Mergenthaler laid it out that way, but the ETA LIN SHRDLU, in theory, is basically the most commonly used letters. And so those are the closest to this space bar button that you hit with your pinky when you're operating the line inside. Well, and I, I'd say I don't have any proof for this, but obviously by the time that Mergenthaler is developing the keyboard, you not only have the typewriter, which is one form, maybe people were not happy with QWERTY even in by you know the 18, early 1880s or late 1870s, but the other is that, um, you know, you just look at a type case, so the type case has letter frequency. So ostensibly, uh, and Mergenthaler did not have a type background. And by the way, we think that Mergenthaler counted the letters in the type case. Yes, that's right. That would make sense, right? Because then you go to Scheidenwriting Company. Yeah. Scheidenwriting yeah, I mean, Company in Baltimore mm -hmm. was a company he was very closely associated with. And supposedly he went in there and counted them. And he said, that's printers right. know what they need. They need a lot of E's and T's and A's. Yeah, I mean, that seems that's like right. the most likely explanation because it was already sort of pre-optimized for, for usage. But it is funny. I mean, of all the history that survives, I have never seen anything about that either, but why, um, if, when you get to the monotype, by the way, there's a monotype adopted QWERTY, but what's funny, they didn't use uh, the et to Owen, but um, the type archive, which is now closed, they had a monotype keyboard there with a layout I'd never seen before. I was there a few years ago, and it's got a very early prototype number. Yeah, I saw that yeah, as well. 1890s, right, like 92, or it's very early. And it is a totally, it's not related to any, I sent you a picture from there, they did not relate to any other keyboard style I'd seen, and they abandoned it very quickly uh, after that. And of course, the monotype keyboard had to handle all those accents and special right. characters in Europe, and, and w that's why mathematics and chemical notation was all done with monotype machines over the years. It's impossible to do it on a linotype machine. So we now have two machines, two keyboards. One goes down the road to office use and general use, QWERTY. One goes down the road to typesetting, e toin if you will. People pronounce it differently. <laughs> um, and so we now, and, and the typewriter keyboard really <coughs> starts to modify slightly as we get into the computer world. Is that what you saw? Yeah, I think there were, QWERTY got solidified so quickly that it's almost hard to believe, uh, given the, how much competition there was still well uh, in the 19th century and 20th century. There were some modifications first for electric typewriters, because they're operated with a lot more force. So that's why you have some symbols like the apostrophe and the quotation mark on the same key, because you could have the, the key use less force so you wouldn't mm -hmm. puncture the paper. Mm -hmm. right. And having two smaller symbols on one key was just easier to do. And then computers kind of like, you know, there were all of these arguments about where the caps lock or shift lock goes and stuff like that. So there were definitely some modifications, but they're always, since 1901 happened at the peripheral, mm -hmm. right? Like the QWERTY is sacred. Not exchanging there, and we only change things around, which is, I think, really interesting.